Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Bank Hall Mission Church uh, this morning, especially if you're visiting us or for the first time. Uh, my name is Eddie. Uh, I'm the assistant pastor here, and I'm going to be uh, leading us through the service for the next hour or so. Um, I think that's all I need to say. So I'm welcome. Uh, so I'm gonna we're gonna say our psalm together. Uh, it's in the book on the screen, and um, we're gonna say Psalm 146, the first two verses. Uh, together as we focus ourselves uh, on who we're here to to praise, on who we are here to love and serve, and that is uh, our Lord. So let's say these uh, words together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. So while we are here, living our lives on this world, waiting for Jesus to return, we are to praise the Lord. So let's do that first in song, shall we? Let's sing, And Can It Be? Please stand.
pray together. Um, so please uh, do uh, follow along me, our leaders in prayer. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Father God, we thank you for the truth of those words, that you showed your amazing love for your rebellious creatures by taking on humanity and the shame and agony of the cross. Lord, you are the God who made the heaven and earth, who is always faithful, always just, and always loving. You are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. You are good to all you have made. You deserve praise and worship forever because of the glory of who you are. Lord, despite our weakness, you have blessed us with the knowledge of your Son and what he has done for us. You have given us your spirit as a mark of having been adopted by you and given new hearts that can love and obey you. You have united us to your Son forever, and everything that he has, we can enjoy forever. We thank you that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, and instead we've been born again into a living hope that can never be taken away because it is secure in Christ. Father God, we thank you that in uniting us to Christ, you have also united us together as your people. We thank you for the church, and we pray that we would follow your commands to love one another so that the world might see and turn to you. We pray for those who are not able to be with us in person and who are sick. We pray that they would know your love and care for them. We pray for those who are struggling today with things that are going on in their lives. Lord, help us to cling on to you and to one another. Help us to trust one another and to pray for each other in the times when life is difficult. Lord, please strengthen us and remind us that you want us to come to you in our struggles so that you can refresh us and remind us that your strength can carry us through every hard time and grow us in our faith. We pray also for the wider church, for those who are meeting together today, we pray that you'll be encouraging them and strengthening them by your grace. And Lord, we pray for those who are meeting under difficult conditions or who aren't able to meet at all. We pray that you'll be with them, growing them and encouraging them and strengthening them despite the, the persecution they suffer. We pray that you would grow us all in our knowledge of you more and more so that we might know you better and give thanks for the inheritance you have given to us in Christ. Father, we pray for our world, we pray for those around us, our family, friends and neighbours that do not know you. We pray that you would reveal yourself to them and that we would be fearless in taking the gospel out to those who need to hear it. And we pray for the things that are going on in our world, Lord. This is your world and, and you know everything that happens. And we pray for those things unknown to anybody but you, for the people who need you, for the hopeless situations that many suffer in. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who sets captives free and establishes justice. And we look forward to the time when you do that finally, when Christ returns. We continue to pray for the war in Ukraine and in Gaza, and that there will be an end to the violence and suffering in those places. Lord, we lift all these prayers to you, trusting in your will and knowing that you have everything in your hands. Amen. Amen. Uh, it's time for the kids to go to fresh. You ready? Yeah? So, um, my, my children are going to leave. <laughs> are you going to go to Stephanie and Mum? Are you going to go? And after they leave, we're going to say, um, we're going to go into our catechism and uh, we're looking at question nine. It's going to come up on the screen. So I'll ask, I'll ask the question. And then um, if we can all say the answer in response. <coughs> so question nine. What does God require in the first, second, and third commandments? First, that we know and trust God as the only true and living God. Second, that we avoid idolatry and do not worship God improperly. Third, that we treat God's name with fear and reverence. Honouring also his words and works. I'm going to read a passage of scripture um, to help us uh, understand that. It's not just something that someone's made up. They've taken it from the Bible. Uh, Deuteronomy 16, verses 13 to 14. It is the Lord your God you shall fear. Him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. 
You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are around you. God is the one we build our hope on. Uh, he is the only one we can hope on. We're going to sing about that now as we uh, sing, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Let's stand and sing together. Um, time in our service where we're going to take uh, the Lord's Supper together, where we're going to have communion. 
Um, the life we've just sung, our hope is built on Jesus' love and righteousness, and that hope is shown as we take the Lord's Supper together. Um, this is a meal for those who trust in Christ's death for them, who have been made righteous through faith and have been adopted into God's family. And before we take this meal together, it is right that we acknowledge that we are not worthy to take this meal because of how good we are. So uh, in 1 John 1, verses 8 and 9, John says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let me pray for us. Father God, we come to you knowing that we are sinners and that we have been unfaithful to you. We confess of what we have done or thought or said that has not glorified you and instead has rebelled against your word. Father, we thank you that where we are faithless, you are faithful and are quick to forgive our sins and that our unrighteousness is washed away by your overflowing righteousness and grace. We pray that you would work in our hearts by your Spirit as we take this meal together to remind us of the love you have shown to us through the death of your Son and that his love would continue to transform us into his likeness. Amen. Amen. So we take this bread and uh, wine, grape juice, uh, not trusting in our own righteousness, but in Jesus Christ. So Hebrews 9 verse 24 says, For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, that's talking about the temple, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly, as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then he would, have, he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. So as we take the bread and wine together now, we do so knowing that in some way Christ is with us spiritually, while physically being in the throne room of heaven, interceding with God on our behalf. And we'll keep doing that until he returns to save everybody who trusts and is waiting on him. Uh, so I'm going to ask um, Trevor and Neil to come up and help with administration. Thanks, guys. And who wants to pray for us? Neil's going to pray for us. Thank you, Neil. Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you are a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. You don't treat us as our deeds deserve. You have cast our sins far away as far as these deeds is from us. We just thank you, Lord, that uh, you sent Jesus to die for us on the cross. He took upon himself all our sins, that the punishment that we deserved, that he did not. He gave us the righteousness that we don't have. So we can stand before you, a holy God, forgiven, redeemed. And we thank you, Lord, that we're being restored again. We thank you, Lord, we have that relationship with you. We have that wonderful uh, promise and hope of a, a future of eternal life, but also abundant life here and now. We just thank you for this opportunity we have here and we gather together here as a, as a fellowship of believers, uh, one, one in spirit and purpose, taking of the bread mm -hmm. and the cup to remember and reflect upon and give the praise and adoration that you deserve for the sacrifice that Jesus went through on our behalf. Help us Lord to, to ponder on the, the pain and the suffering that he, he went through, the torment uh, as he held upon himself all the world's uh, sin on his shoulders. Uh, that separation from you is heavenly Father. And we thank you, Lord, that he defeated sin and death once and for all, rose victorious from the grave, and is alive today. And we thank you, Lord, that Jesus is coming again. And help us until then to regularly come together and worship you in this way. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen.
Um, so, like I said, uh, this meal is for anybody who acknowledges their sin, who the, tr who the truth is in, and is trusting in Christ's death for them as God's power to save. Um, if that's not you, um, we are really, really glad that you are here. Uh, you are so, so welcome. Uh, you can let the bread and the, and the juice just pass by you with no embarrassment, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, but we would love to be love for you to be thinking about um, what we've said and just to watch as, as we take this meal together. Um, we're now going to pass out, pass out the bread. Um, and if you can keep hold of it until everybody has some, and then we'll take it together when everyone does. And uh, please do just um, use the time of quiet to, uh, to come to God, to pray, uh, and to be with him. And then in a few moments, I will um, read some scripture and then we'll take the bread. Apostle Paul says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. We're now going to pass out the, um, the grape juice. Again, please just use this time to reflect uh, on Christ's body broken for us, bloodied for us, and be grateful. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued mercy towards us. We thank you that while you were, we were still far off from you, you loved us and sent your Son to reconcile us to you and give us life and a living hope. Lord, we pray that you would make Christ big in our hearts, renew our joy in your saving gospel, and strengthen us to go into the week to love you and one another in all that we do. Amen. Amen. Well, like that uh, verse from Hebrews said, Christ came once for all sins. Uh, we're going to collect... The, uh, the glasses in from you. Um, but as we think about that verse in Hebrews, we are going to sing, it was finished upon that cross, reminding ourselves that the work is done and Christ is now sat, meaning finished, 
at the right hand of the Father. Let's sing together. <laughs> Just a time for some quick notices. Um, nothing huge uh, going on kind of in the normal week. Uh, we have uh, the, the women's, uh, uh, women's meeting on uh, Monday and uh, Tuesday night is uh, home groups as well as Wednesday here at the church at 2 o'clock. We'll spend some Bible study then. And Friday night uh, is Friday Club. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who came to the men's breakfast yesterday. Uh, we had a really good time, uh, good breakfast, and we had really good conversation as well. Uh, if you do want to come and join in with that, uh, we're reading this book together, just come and get me, let me know, I'll order some more books and get them to you for the next time, um, which will be the beginning of, um, what month are we in now? March. Um, we'll be in the beginning of April and we'll confirm the date um, as soon as we can. Uh, the only things to kind of bring to your attention are, uh, as we've said before, the World Men's Conference is coming up the 11th of May 2024, that's this year, sorry, somehow I haven't slept much. Um, but the other thing to put to give to your attention is the uh, Women's Day Conference being held at Bethel Church on the 23rd of March, uh, 10 to 3.15, uh, 11. And you can uh, find out more from Kay. Yes. 
Yeah, find out more from Kay if you'd like to find out anything else, uh, anything else about that. <laughs> Apparently, you can also keep up to date with everything at Bancor by doing what it just said then that I didn't quite catch. <laughs> but, so keep up to date with everything going on. <laughs> and next Sunday, we are going to be um, carrying on in Exodus and Paul is going to be uh, preaching to us, God willing. So uh, please do be in prayer for that. Um, we're going to have our reading and talk in just a few moments, but we're going to have one more song. We're going to sing together, The Lord's My Shepherd. It is good to welcome you to our service today and um, we do pray that as we spend time together that it will be a great blessing and help to us. So if you would like to turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 5, Exodus chapter 5, uh, which is the second book in the Bible, in the Old Testament, that's page 48. If you are using a, a church Bible, if you want one, you can get one from the back and you can follow the reading. Uh, it's a long reading today, so I'm reading chapter 5 just now, and then in the course of the uh, sermon, we're going to read part of uh, chapter 6. So in the first instance, it will be this chapter. Just as you're looking it up, let me bring to your attention, of course, that we're not that far away from Easter, uh, end of the month, and uh, I think we've noted it already, but uh, good for you to set it in your mind that we will start the uh, Easter meetings on the Thursday evening, 7 o'clock, we'll be meeting here and we'll be having communion, communion together. So if you could manage that, it's a lovely way just to start uh, the journey through Easter and uh, it's been helpful to us the years that we have been doing it. Then uh, on Easter Friday morning, 
uh, will be gathering here at 10.30. Oral Park will be joining with us and uh, Eddie's going to be preaching at that service. So uh, we look forward to uh, Good Friday being here and then on Sunday we'll be back here of course for uh, 11 o'clock service for um, Easter Sunday. We are hoping maybe uh, if there's anybody available and want to do it, it might be seen a strange thing, but it's an opportunity for us to be together, just a few, um, to do a litter pick on uh, Easter Saturday. So if you're around, more details of that near the uh, time, uh, we'll go around and we'll just uh, share in the community in that way uh, and maybe come back here and uh, have a few pastries together or something. Uh, the less people that come, the more paces there will be for each of you. Um, but no, please do, if you can come, then we can <coughs> share together and uh, spend a few moments uh, uh, before we go out for the rest of the day. It's Exodus chapter 5 and it's verse 1. Afterwards Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may uh, hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has uh, met with us. Please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, Let us go and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men, that they may labour at it, and pay no regard to lying words. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves, wherever you can find it, but your work will not be redu reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for the straw, uh, for straw, the taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task each day, as when there was no there was straw. And the foremen of the people of Israel, whom Pharaoh's test taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, uh, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? Then the foremen of the people of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle, you are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foreman of the people of Israel saw that they were in trouble uh, when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh, and they said to them, the Lord look on you and judge, because you've made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why do you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's done evil to this people, and you've not delivered your people at all. The start of the Great War, or as it's now referred to, World War I, it's reported uh, that the, the message was, it will all be over by Christmas. The boys would be back home. Whether that was a statement just to give confidence, uh, it certainly wasn't the reality. It would be four years later when the boys would return, but they will leave behind some 750,000 fellow soldiers buried in a foreign field. Such was the terrible nature of that warfare. But there were great expectations that the war would be short-lived, that victory would be secured. What's to stop us? 
Let's go and win. As we come to this chapter, so the people have been under oppression. The Hebrew people, the Israelites, have been under oppression and slavery of the king of Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. And because of that, and it's got increasingly difficult, they've been crying out to the Lord. So you go back to chapter 2 and uh, we read they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning. It's a terrible day. They're cried out to God, but God hears them. Moses and Aaron, although Moses, it has to be said, was a little bit reluctant, they have now come to Egypt. They've been sent by God, and they've got a message of deliverance. God is going to sort it out. God is going to come and make sure he will answer your groaning and bring you out of this land. That's the great promise. And we left them then in chapter 4, uh, which would have uh, been preached the other week. In chapter 4, verses uh, 29 uh, to the end, Moses and Aaron went, gathered together the elders of the people, spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses. They did signs in the sight of the people. Then verse 31 of chapter 4, And the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel, that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. So that's where we leave them in chapter 4. It's a great meeting. It's a, a wonderful occasion. Signs from Moses and Aaron. And uh, as they listen to the message, they are enthused and excited that God is going to do something. And they, they worship because that's what you would do. God's going to do something. Thank you, God. Praise God. So that's where we lead, lead them. The Saviour has come. The Liberator is here. God has heard their groaning. But as this chapter unfolds, chapter 5, a different set of emotions emerge. But one of the purposes that will transpire is that these people, despite what's going to happen, it's going to be difficult, they're going to, dis they're going to discover who God is. If you Fast forward to chapter uh, 7 and verse 5. You'll read there, The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand. So the Egyptians are going to be, uh, through all this uh, stuff that's going to happen, they're going to know who God is. But in chapter 8 and verse 22, as they have one of the plagues, the land of Goshen, where the people, are, the Hebrew people are dwelling, they won't know these swarms, and uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. So the Egyptians will know, the Hebrew people will know that I am the Lord. Through all of these terrible things that are going to happen, they're going to know God. But we posed the question this morning for our sermon, well, where is God? Because at this point, in chapter 5 and chapter 6, it looks like God is very absent. The deliverance is not happening. Happening. It's certainly not over by Christmas or the equivalent for the Hebrew people. And we said a couple of questions in our worksheet. Um, there are three questions, but a couple of the questions kind of reflect something of this nature. How do we feel when we have to wait for something? And then how do we feel when you think your prayers are not being answered. Israelites are waiting, and they still have to keep waiting. And if you have to wait for something, that can be frustrating and difficult. And then you're praying, and the, the Israelites have been praying, they've been groaning to the Lord, and it doesn't get any better. If anything, it gets worse. If it just maybe stayed the same, that could just about cope. But as we go through chapter 5, it gets worse and worse and worse. So where is God? in all the mess. And as we come to chapter 6, we'll just see how they respond to the positive message that Moses will bring to them. We'll come to that in just a little while. The reality is that God, God never promised a quick fix. Chapter 3, verse 18, uh, he says this, um, 
The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us, and now please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness, that we may sacrifice to our God. But I know, verse 19, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. And then chapter 4, verse 21 uh, we read, And the Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. So that's, though there's a message of deliverance, there is this other message that either they're not hearing clearly or choosing to think God's going to do something and it's going to happen very quickly. Chapter 5 we read then, in the first instance, the message is delivered. Moses comes, brings a message to Pharaoh, uh, and then the foremen of the people, they come in chapter 15, not so much with a message, but they come with a, a complaint in terms of what's happening in the land. When our children would return from the Contagious Youth Camp, uh, which is a Bible conference camp, unfortunate name given the uh, uh, COVID. But anyway, they still call it contagious. And, uh, and uh, all these young people go and they're enthusiastic and they're learning together. And ours uh, would come home and uh, they would be very, very tired, but uh, they would be enthusiastic. Uh, they would be strengthened in a sense. And they would be, we would talk for a while on these uh, spiritual Christian things. They were ready to press on. And the evidence of that would maybe evaporate quite quickly and we would go back to what might be normal. As they engage with life and spiritual battles, uh, that being part of a follower of Jesus, it got tough. But that initial enthusiasm, enthusiasm was no bad thing and over the years it grew and matured. But they were learning, learning stuff. And it's the same actually for us. Um, we get enthusiastic and then it can quickly disappear. Our kind of promises, what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. We get discouraged and disappointed. Well, Moses and Aaron are now going into Pharaoh with their message. The message is, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. So on the back of this intense time of worship and signs, uh, those have been affirming for them, and uh, the elders have accepted this wonderful occasion. God is with them. The message is given in very clear terms. This is what God says. This is what we need to do. Some take issue with Moses, that he delivers a message of slight variance with what was spoken in chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, some say, well, there's a wrong delegation. Uh, the elders should have been there. There's a wrong terminology. The Lord God of Israel should have been the, the Lord of the Hebrews. Uh, there's a lot wrong request that uh, it should have been a three-day feast. Well, you can unpack all of that sort of stuff. Uh, what we can say is that God's word was spoken right in the center of the place of authority and power. The message is delivered right at the heart of rule and control. And the two spokesmen of God present the communication from God. Thus says the Lord, the covenantal God, the covenant-keeping God, which, of course, is the name of the Lord in those capital letters in your Bible. Later in the chapter, due to, of course, the response of Pharaoh, which we're going to see in a moment, the Hebrew foremen come, and they're calling for relief from this harshness and hardness, and you can understand them going. They want instant relief. They've been praying, but it, their lives have got worse. But the fact is that God is behind all of this. He's promised to bring them out. And it is not just, but it's not just in the way they want. They've got an idea of how things are going to happen. And it just doesn't look like it's happening in that way. This then results in the response of the people in verse 21. And they said to um, Moses, the Lord look on you and judge. There's strong language here. The Lord look on you and judge because you've made us stink. Uh, I mean, sometimes we're, we might have a strong aroma, but what these people are saying is that we've become obnoxious 
to the king. And so much so that he has given us a very, very hard burden. And it's getting worse. And Moses then comes to God, doesn't he? And he says, well, what was the point of me coming here? I mean, look what's happened. Ever since I've come, it's actually all gone wrong and you haven't delivered your people. What you said you would do has not happened. Hold on, Moses, what was the message that he said it was? That Pharaoh's heart was going to be hard and that he would not let the people go. And all the other stuff that Moses had kind of uh, heard. The worship of chapter 4, 31 seems to have disappeared very quickly in the light of the developing circumstances. It's a tough day, but God has spoken. The message has been delivered. What can we learn? Well, we can learn that God is true to his promises. This is God's word, and he will see to it, that's for sure. It's going to be further down the track that it will be fully developed, but God will keep his promises. God will give a way of escape. And much as they would have liked their circumstances to change fairly quickly, we need to understand that God is intending something by the circumstances and the challenges. The same for us, often we might think, if only we could get that trouble taken out of our lives. Lord, take that suffering away from me. Now, of course, we'd all naturally pray that. But sometimes God says, I'm leaving something here. It's not happening immediately. Because I'm going to do something far greater. We come back to the questions on the, the worksheet. How do we feel when we have to wait for something? Well, it's not always easy. Maybe the younger you are, the harder it might be. The reality is even when you're older, it's tough waiting for things. Many questions can be formed in our lives. Challenges in abundance. But if we're a follower of Jesus and we're facing some challenges and we're having to wait, maybe one of the big things is that we need to learn to trust God doesn't always look to be there. Where is he here? Well, chapter 6 is going to show us where God is, but the people aren't seeing it. And we need to trust that God's there. We know the sun is always shining, even when the clouds are covering it. It's still there. And we know that God's always there, even in the hardest moment and the deepest challenge. And we also need to learn that God is answering prayer. He does hear the groaning of his people. And we've often said that God answers prayer. He does say yes. He does say let's wait. And he does say no, and no is an answer. Paul prayed that God would take away the thorn in the flesh, whatever it was, and God says, no, I'm going to leave it there. That's an answer. Not the answer Paul wanted, but God leaves things for some reason, and he will help us in the meantime. So the message is delivered. It's a message that uh, God is going to do something, and they can trust. Moses and Aaron can trust. The people can trust, and Pharaoh can know that it's going to happen. But... In the second place, verses 2 to 14 and then 17 to 19, the message is rejected. Either the message from Moses or, or the cry of the people to Pharaoh is rejected in both cases. Get on with the work, you lazy lot. The message in verse 1 is, thus says the Lord. The message in verse 10, and I don't think it's any accident, is, thus says Pharaoh, God is saying something, but Pharaoh says, I am saying something. Seems to me the battle lines are being drawn as uh, this king, Pharaoh, sets himself in opposition to God, the God of heaven. I'm going to have my way on this one. It's the second time that Pharaoh's claimed not to know. Uh, here in verse 2, who is this Lord? I don't know this Lord. And in chapter 1, verse 8, 
he claims that he doesn't know Joseph. No, it may be true to some extent, but he's not altogether ignorant. And I think he's more inclined to think that he chose not to know. The history of Egypt would be recorded, written down, the stories would be told. There was a famine. It might have been a whole lot of years ago, but such was the nature of that famine that it would be a story that was passed down generation to generation, and each succeeding king would have the kind of documents that would state the history of the nation, the history of the land, and all that was recorded. So the famine story around Joseph would have been well known, as well as the settling of the Hebrew people in Goshen. But he chooses to ignore or not to inform himself of these things and sets himself up as God in the terms of what he says. Thus says Pharaoh. He does everything then that will somehow invalidate the aims of the God of heaven. The message is given let my people go. He will do absolutely everything not to let them go. And he opposes God then at every point. Uh, maybe the flavour of that can be picked up in verse 9. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labour at it and pay no regard to their lying words. And then uh, verse 18. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. It's just heaping up the burden that they're having to carry every day. And so, to some degree, Pharaoh looks like he's being successful. He's browbeating the people down. They are dispirited and broken. There's no way out for them. And they're going to have to work in Egypt. This is the king, and he's the power, and he's in control. And to, as I say, he looks like he's being successful. The reality is that humanity and history is set against the message of God. As Pharaoh was down through the ages, that's always the case. The heart of man is rebellion. Rebellion, and Pharaoh and Egypt illustrate and demonstrate that framework and that lifestyle that claims control of its destiny, that says, I am the king, we are the kings. We will do what we want. That's played out in everyday life today. Played out in our own hearts sometimes. We will do what we want. We will live the life that we want to live. We're in control of our own destiny. We will not submit to any notion of a deity who would make any sort of uh, claim or demand on our kingship. I'm the king, and I will rule. And it's like we're shaking our fists at God, which is a ludicrous thing, because we're just small and insignificant, and God is mighty and all-powerful. But we do it. We do it in, or governments and systems might do it directly, opposing Christianity. Or it can be displayed in just general apathy, indifference, and a claim of ignorance. But rebellion it is when we continue to maintain that we are kings, and we're in control, and want to be in control. But God says, I am the Lord. So we do well to give that some thought to all that God has said and to submit our lives to his loving grace-filled rule. Because if you compare the rules, whatever transpires in the future, there is grace and mercy with God in some form or another. There is judgment and it becomes very clear. Judgment upon those that say, listen, I'm not going to listen, I'm going to go my own way. But there's mercy and grace. There's liberation and salvation to those that are taken out and some foreigners with them. The last thing is in chapter 6 and verses 1 to 13, and that's the message is affirmed. Let's read those verses and then we will uh, quickly make the application before we finish for this morning. 
So it's verse 1 of chapter 6. But the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see, or you shall see, what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand he will send him out, and with a strong hand he will drive him out of his land. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they've lived as sojourners. Moreover, I've heard the groaning of the people of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I've remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egypt, and I will deliver you from, the slavery, from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who's brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am the Lord. Moses spoke these uh, thus to the people of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. So the Lord said to Moses, go in and tell Pharaoh king of Egypt to let the people of Israel go out of this land. But Moses said to the Lord, behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. Where is God? God is right here. And the people need to learn that I am the Lord. This is the name that hasn't, as it were, been disclosed. But bit by bit, through all the events and through everything that is happening, they're going to learn that I am the Lord. So, from the people and Moses' perspective, up to this point, nothing seems to be going as planned. It's a mess. It's a big mess. It's not going as they expected. It's not all over. It's got worse. Moses petitions God and chapter 6 then affirms that God has a plan and that nothing's going to stop it. He's the covenant-keeping God, verses 2 to 4. He's heard the plight of the people, verse 5. And now there's a series of elements that should be reassuring to the people, verses 6 to 8, the things that God is going to do. The opening statement is important. I am the Lord. This is what they're going to have to appreciate and understand. The fact that they cannot even accept any of this at the moment is summed up in verse 9. They are desperate, they are broken, they are battered and bruised. And they're just, it's like, listen Moses, you come with a whole lot of messages. We cannot believe you. But despite how they feel, overwhelmed and downtrodden, it doesn't deny the truth that God has spoken, and God will speak, and God will do. They need to come to terms with the fact that God is God, and he will do what he says, in his way, in his time, and all the earth will know who he is. Throughout God's word, we have an affirmation of truth. His word is seen and clearly seen. This is God and this is what he does. And so you and I this morning can rest assured there may well be days of doubt and question and even despair and great despondency, but this is who God is. And the journey that we are on, if we are his people and we're followers of King Jesus, there will be great days of uh, blessing and help, and there'll be days of challenge and question. But in either case, God is who he is. We know this because God continues to work his purposes out today. And we know this because he's fully worked his purposes out in his son Jesus. And I think some parallels are worth noting just as we finish. You see, Jesus Christ is the great Saviour, the great deliverer. Moses was to be the liberator. He came. Jesus is the great liberator. Expectations among the disciples and the people were not always realised. They had an idea of what was going to happen. It didn't happen. It was something different. 
because they had to learn that Jesus was the Son of God and that Jesus had a purpose and he had a message and he had something he was going to do and they need to understand what that was. His words, that is Jesus' words, were met uh, with a deal of opposition. On the one hand, uh, they were opposed and on the other hand, there was unbelief. We cannot even trust anything this man said. Humanity is set against Christ and the purposes of Christ. But God will not be stopped. He will perform and fulfill all that he's promised to do. And the cross and the resurrection demonstrate, though the whole backing of hell have come out against it, it won't be stopped. And as it were, Satan-inspired Pharaoh comes out against God. But God is going to be the one who wins and has the victory. We commence with the question, well, where is God? He's all here. One commentator says the most impressive aspect of this passage are the emphasis on the absolute confidence of God, the clarity of his intentions, and the comprehensiveness of of his promises. Hold on, we've got nine, ten plagues to get through yet. We've got a bunch of trouble ahead. Where are the promises? They're still there. Written large. Grasp the truth. We didn't read it, because sometimes these genealogies can have to be full of names, but and you can read it when you go home. But there's a the genealogy sandwiched here, but the, 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 the names of the, the children and the tribes. I think all that does seems strange, you've got it there, but I think what it does, it authenticate uh, authenticates the lines of the history. It establishes that history, but it also highlights the future. There is something ahead. Where you've got these tribes, there's something ahead. And this is what God is going to use for his glory. Where is God? God's all here. We're learning, I am the Lord. I hope you're learning that. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus. Well, you've learned who Christ is. You're still learning because it's a journey. But maybe this morning you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. The message that we bring Sunday by Sunday is said, this is the Lord. This is the King. This is the covenant-keeping God. This is the Christ. Hear, respond, and follow. Let's pray. And then we're going to sing our closing hymn. Father in heaven, we thank you that we do have your word. It is a living word. And we need to wait on you. We are not always what we should be. But as followers of King Jesus, we pray uh, that you will just uh, grasp our hearts. Maybe some of us are going through some very challenging times. Maybe there is a despair in our minds and hearts. Oh, God of heaven, come and let us hear the affirmation of all that you've done for us in Christ. Maybe there are those here who do not know Jesus as Saviour. Father in heaven, we pray that there will be a grasping of who Jesus is today, a realisation that there is no one else. Let's come to the King, the only King, the all-powerful King, our Saviour. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, let's uh, sing together as we conclude our service. Remind you that we have refreshments served afterwards in the back hall, so don't uh, go off. Uh, let's spend a little time together conversing, maybe sharing together something of what we're learning from uh, Scripture, uh, what we've been learning through the singing of these hymns. Uh, good conversations. May God bless us as we have them together over tea, coffee, etc. But uh, we're going to sing, so that will help us uh, in those conversations as we teach one another we won't fear the battle, we won't fear the night, we will walk the valley with you by our side. Let's stand and let's sing this praise and let's claim these promises.
prayers we conclude. Heavenly Father, we're on a journey and we may be in different parts of that journey. Some of us may well be despairing and the, even the idea of singing with joy seems to be far removed from us. We're more like the people, broken and despairing. But we thank you, King Jesus, that you um, are with us and indeed you suffered more than we could ever suffer. We might think there's no one suffering like us, but we thank you, King Jesus, you <coughs> suffered. Uh, the just for the unjust, to bring us to yourself. Lord, we pray that we'll just grasp, even in the difficulty, that King Jesus is there and is alongside and draws out that we may sing these praises and understand the great work of heaven in our hearts. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Let's be seated. And again, remind you of the refreshments. Just go through when you're ready.